people have questions we've already gotten some emails so thank you so much uh, but welcome and thank you for spending some time here on a tuesday morning to discuss what is on all of our minds which is coronavirus and how do we get out of this pandemic and how do we reach the end of the tunnel we know there's a light at the end of the tunnel but what is the um conclusion of this so we were going to really take a deep dive to the end of COVID-19 and the updates that we have some of the updates just happened yesterday so I had some time this morning to to research this a little bit more to get the most latest updates on this but first I'd like to hear from you um, thank you again for attending here um, what topics are you most interested in covering so um, we are going to talk about vaccines uh, as our main focus of today, since I know a lot of people have questions about that. Um, so here are some of the choices. I, I think, Jen, this is a um, multiple choice question, right? Yes. Um, what do we know about the COVID vaccine? What are the vaccine options? Currently, there's three major options. Two of them are FDA, EUA um, authorized. Um, and then the, the third one is not yet authorized. And then there's vaccine concerns, and then there's what is the timeline for release? So now just as a disclaimer, as we continue to discuss COVID-19 vaccines, I mean, I'm certainly not the all-knowing expert on COVID vaccines. I think I've tried my best to synthesize these things, done a lot of research over the, the past few months and really the last year on COVID and how we can help our immune systems naturally. But in terms of vaccines, I'm certainly not the expert in it. I, I do have some um, ability to, uh, discuss certain things with some of the top vaccine experts in the country, but uh, but I'm not those experts myself. So, all right, great. So a lot of people wanna know about everything, which is good. Um, I think we'll cover all these topics. Certainly the vaccine options are, uh, we'll go into detail today. Okay, so let me close this. So just a quick office update. So we are open to uh, the public, uh, luckily and thankfully, our potential COVID exposure case came back negative, and also luckily the the people or persons are totally they're 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 doing okay. So again, again, we're really grateful for that. The office was pro professionally deep cleaned with with uh, thymol, which is actually a natural substance from thyme that gets uh, over ninety nine percent of microorganisms as a precaution anyway. So, but we did reopen on Monday. Um, let's see, there's some chats here. Okay, let's see. So let me look at the chat. Uh, guy, okay, uh, so Wendy, you're gonna have to please let me know about the, uh, that a little bit more. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, <clears throat> guy health and COVID as per China study. Um, please include testing, different types of tests. Sure, I can do that. Thank you, Dave. Um, do I have an opinion about nebulized hydrogen peroxide? Uh, yes, I think that could be an option. Um, virus variants and efficacy. These are great questions, by the way. Um, where do we get the cleaner? Uh, can you be more specific about that? Sorry. And then any concerns about long-term safety of mRNA? And do we need to worry about alterations to DNA? Okay, those are super important. I'm gonna address all those today. Um, I think I'll start with testing because that's not on these slides. Um, initially, we started out with antibody testing and that we do offer in our clinic. Um, those are blood antibody tests. Of course, there's different types of immunity to, uh, to coronavirus. There's B cell immunity, which is measured as antibodies that can be measured in the bloodstream. So those are things like immunoglobulin G and M antibodies, and those would potentially reflect past exposure or current acute exposure respectively. However, when you look at it, this is not all of immunity because we know that T cells actually drive a lot of long-term immunity. So T killer cells, T memory cells, these are gonna be really important for long-term immunity because in SARS-CoV-1, which is the first SARS coronavirus that I think happened about a couple of decades ago, it has been shown to have potentially decades of immunity based on the T cell response. So that's actually more important than the B cell response, even though the B cell response is more easily measured. Then you think about the polymerase chain reaction or PCR testing, and those are called nucleic acid amplification testing. That's your, that's your typical, um, basically uh, nasal swabs, throat swabs, things like that. 
nasal swabs would tend to be more accurate than a throat swab, typically because most of the virus lives in the nose, not the mouth. Um, when you go to urgent care, when you go to a pharmacy and you get an NAA nasal swab, that's what they're looking for is DNA. Now, the problem with that test, however, even though it's considered pretty sensitive, 90, 90 plus percent sensitive, I think in practice, it may not be quite as sensitive as that, it might be more like 75% based on the fact that the DNA that's that's tested and a DNA test is, is fragments of DNA. So it's not really all of uh, coronavirus. But then the other thing is that it doesn't really differentiate between an active infection and fragments of DNA for someone that doesn't have active virus. So it doesn't really say, hey, this is a live kind of testing. Uh, this is a live virus. This is something infectious or not. So you can still have someone with positive DNA test, but yet not infectious at that point if their immune system is already counteracting the virus. I think that the only one that's been shown through a FDA EUA to be considered active virus is a salivary test, which is through vaulthealth.com, which is a cash pay test. That I think it's about $100, $150 or something like that. But you can measure a salivary test and that is one way to do it. The gold standard is considered the, the NAA, the PCR nasal swab test at this point. Um, the nebulized hydrogen peroxide, I haven't used that myself personally or with patients, but I've heard a lot of people, you know, use that or consider using that in the integrative community and be open to that. And, and I do think hydrogen peroxide has some merit in terms of having antiviral effect overall. Um, so, you know, so, so I, I can see that being a possibility, yes. So that's a great one. Thank you, Mary. Um, I think the virus variants, I, I think I'll try to cover that in the next and the part we talk about the vaccines, but there's basically two known variants so far. There's the, there's the variant from the UK in which it's been shown to have to already spread to California, New York. So I, I bet that one's already here, but it's hard to say. That one is supposed to be not, uh, th that's supposed to be not affected, uh, not affecting the efficacy of the vaccines, um, but it is making the virus more transmissible. Um, then there's the South African variant, which I think is, you know, there's no evidence that that's in the U.S. at this point. However, that one has been um, cautioned by experts that that might be that might diminish the efficacy of the vaccines, but not enough is known about that yet. So those are the two variants that I know about: the U.K. and the South African vaccine. I think in terms of hydrogen peroxide, it's probably something we could, in theory, prescribe via compounding pharmacy. If you're interested in more than that, just, just uh, shoot me an email and I'll research that for you. Something like Hopkinton would be one, one place in Massachusetts that likely would have that. Um, yes, thank you. We're so glad uh, we're well. Thank you so much, Maria. Please share questions with all. With all. Yes, Monica. Yes, if people have questions, just send them to, to everyone. Um, okay, I'm gonna go change my slides. Yes, uh, I was just trying to get to some of the questions here. Um, so just a little overview of coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So right now in the, in the world, I just checked this today, 90.9 million cases, almost 2 million deaths in the U.S., 20, over 22 million deaths and 376,000 deaths in the U.S. as of today. Um, based on an estimate of the acute cost of the infection, that does not include post-COVID costs direct healthcare costs over $50 billion based on a 77% infection rate. In the, in the months between um, February and uh, May, about 75% of those who died from COVID were age greater than, that's supposed to be 65, not 65%, age greater than 65, and about 75% had at least one underlying health condition, including heart disease and diabetes. And a, a, a University of Southern California study showed that the cost of the U.S. economy could be up to three to five trillion over two years. But I just want to pause for a second because over two, almost two million people, and that means their families are affected, their, their their friends are affected by this. You know, we're all affected by this, really. So just you know, there's a lot of challenges for the survivors out there for us that have luckily survived this so far. Metabolic health challenges, things like post viral myocarditis, even potentially increased risk of heart failure down the line. I think that's why we should make sure we have, you know, cardiology follow up for this, making sure that, uh, you know, people are having to change their lifestyles, not, not, um, not, you know, eating as well, probably not moving as much, their stress levels are through the chart, through the roof, um, 
mental health. I was reading a statistic earlier today that's not on the slide, but you know now it's like 53 percent of people have depression. You know, uh, whereas before it was much less than that. So socioeconomic challenges, more domestic violence, child abuse, educational challenges, uh, job challenges, people losing their jobs, etc. So there's a ton of virus toll. Just to acknowledge that there's really living through this pandemic altogether and this uh, trauma, I would say, in a way. How do we mitigate COVID-19? That's what we kind of want to talk about today. Washing your hands, physical distancing, wearing masks, spending time outdoors, uh, especially during gatherings. Um, these are the evidence-based things that have been shown to be helpful to reduce inflammation for COVID-19, aiming for a healthy body mass index, aiming for uh, reduction in blood sugar if that's elevated, and then also in optimizing vitamin D3 levels above 20. I would say integratively above 50, even our Dr. Anthony Fauci, Tony Fauci does recommend, uh, he takes supplements himself. He, he, um, he does say uh, in, in the public view that vitamin D does have an impact on susceptibility to infection. You know, there's at least two studies that show that one, it reduces risk of you being admitted to the ICU and being hospitalized for COVID. And then number two, it does decrease susceptibility to actually getting COVID. So these are pretty nice studies that, that you know, make it something easy like vitamin D you know, to, to get. Um, and then we always talk about here, the different foundational aspects of lifestyle that I won't spend a lot of time on today, but sleep, mindset, activity, real food, and social connections. I do wanna mention that there is a critical care doctor protocol called the IMS protocol. That's by an integrated group called the Frontline Critical Care Alliance version eight was just released. And this is, we're starting to use this in our practice now. We have um, been seeing some patients too with, you know, either early COVID or want to prevent COVID. And uh, we can use these different things like medications, including, um, Jen, could you send me an email about the nebulized pharmacy question too? That would be helpful. Thank you. Or uh, PANS actually would be helpful. Thank you. Um, ivermectin, which is a medication used for parasites, but also has antiviral effects zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, melatonin, quercetin, which is an antihistamine or anti-inflammatory nutraceutical, and then aspirin if infected to reduce the risk of hypercoagulability, which means blood clotting. So the basics for the vaccine, because I want to have some time more for, um, I want to get through our slides, but have more time for uh, discussion too, is just in general, let's talk about the basics of what a vaccine is. So a vaccine is a biological preparation that provides an active acquired immunity to an infectious disease. So literally you're injecting a substance in your body that then promotes the ability of your body to respond to future um, basically infectious disease that the vaccine is based off of. So vaccines worldwide are being developed for coronavirus in record time with the help of government and private funding. And I think one misconception is that this is a rush job, you know, I think it is rushed and certainly the Operation Warp Speed name doesn't really uh, lend itself to confidence, but um, what the, all the vaccine manufacturers have said anyway is that the, the money, the funding has allowed for the safety, it's just that it's been done in a quicker amount of time. There is a caveat to that that I'll mention later. None of the COVID-19 vaccines contain actual live virus, so you won't get COVID from the vaccine. Um, COVID-19 vaccines do teach the immune system to recognize and fight SARS-CoV-2, which I'll talk about in a minute in terms of details. And then COVID-19 vaccines will not result in a positive PCR test. That means it will not result in a positive nasal swab. That's what David was referring to earlier in his question, but it may result in positive antibody testing. And I'll, I'll tell you why about that in a minute too. So I'm gonna, we're gonna talk today, we're gonna give a balanced view hopefully of what we know about COVID vaccine, what we do not know about COVID vaccine, and then where the future directions are to optimize our immune systems. So people that can get vaccinated with COVID-19 vaccine can still get infected with, with the uh, severe acute respiratory um, COVID-2 syndrome, COVID-2 virus, but they're less likely to get the disease. So they can get infection, but not the disease and the symptoms less likely to get that. It's still possible though. It's not zero, it's not 100% efficacious. COVID-19 vaccines um, with messenger RNA. So this is, I think, a bunch of people have questions about this. I wanna spend a little bit of time on this. COVID vaccines with messenger RNA, which are the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, do not change or interact with your DNA in any way. Now, the, the reason why this doesn't happen is because 
the inject, what happens is you get, you get an injection in your, in your shoulder in one of the shoulders, right? And then some of the muscle cells take up the mRNA, RNA, but most of it gets taken up by these white blood cells called macrophages. So macrophages or macrophages, um, they, they go into the cytoplasm, which is outside the cell nucleus. Now remember that the DNA of your cell is inside the cell nucleus, the center of the cell. So in the cytoplasm is where the macrophages are kind of processing this mRNA and the macrophages are then instructed by the mRNA outside the cell nucleus to produce a piece of the spike protein. It's not the whole spike protein that helps with transmission of coronavirus, it's the piece of it. Um, so you're not getting, you know, if you get a vaccine, you're not getting the virus, you're not getting the spike protein, you're getting the mRNA that's telling the macrophages to produce a piece of the spike protein. And then they display that on the outside of the cell. So the body then re responds to that cell, to that signal outside the cell and produces both a B cell antibody response and a T cell response to the spike protein fragment. So that's how immunity and protection against disease is conferred. And based on the trials, 95% with Pfizer and 94.5% with Moderna across ages, gender and genders and ethnicities. Now, in the Pfizer study, which is the larger one that was done, about 40,000 people, I think this um, ethnic, ethnic, ethnically, this was uh, distributed across sort of uh, a, a lot across, you know, um, sort of population demographic lines. Uh, gender was 50-50 uh, and age was about 40-41% um, above the age of 55 was that study. mRNA vaccines are new to humans in terms of being tested, being, um, being released for, you know, actual vaccination, but scientists have been trying to do mRNA vaccines for two decades on humans. So this is not, they're not unstudied, they're not completely new. In fact, there's four vaccines that are currently in development in addition to the coronavirus um, COVID-19 vaccine that are being developed by companies, including Moderna called a flu, there's a flu vaccine, there's a rabies vaccine, there's a Zika vaccine, and there's a cytomegalovirus vaccine. The reason why these have not been developed yet, even though they're, they, they were developed years earlier is because there's not the same timeline or urgency that is needed for these vaccines. Um, so, so that is one thing though, we, we don't know in terms of, you know, it is new to human, the human population in terms of actually getting introduced, even though it's been studied. So that's something that we don't completely know. Are people that get the COVID vaccine, question two, um, still able to transmit the virus to others? And that we don't know either. Uh, in other words, if someone gets a vaccine, can they still get, if they, if they get the coronavirus, can they transmit it to others, even if they're asymptomatic? And, and we, don't, we don't know that either. Um, how long does natural immunity versus immunity from the vaccine last? Natural immunity, uh, I know that based on studies so far that at least it lasts for four months for most people. It does wane a little bit more in older adults. Um, we don't have any head to head, of course, being that the vaccine's only two months old at this point um, in terms of the release to the public. Um, and the trials are only about four months old completely. So these trials only started in basically October for both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. So we don't know how long natural immunity versus immunity from vaccine lasts. Um, I believe just based on the scientific research on other studies on vaccines and viruses, that it's likely that if you have a robust T cell response, that the vaccine response the, will likely last for for years. It may not be that the antibodies stay around the system for that long, but the T cell response, which in my view functionally is more important, will, will likely last for years or even decades based on previous studies. Um, I know there's a bunch of questions here. I'll try to get to them after this um, slide. Um, how long does, uh, oh yeah, I did that one. Now, uh, studies on vaccines normally last years, but we are only four months into the adult clinical uh, vaccine trials at this point. I know that's a big concern for a lot of people. It is what it is. It's a new vaccine. Um, it, we just don't have the, the long-term data for post what, what's called post-vaccine surveillance that we would have with other vaccines. Uh, but obviously the FDA is looking at this. We're all looking at this very closely as this continues. Um, most vaccine studies last for several years. So that is one thing. 
Um, studies on vaccines in kids just started. This is in ages 12 through 17. They just started in December. And kid, for kids under age 12, I don't think that they've been studied yet. Um, what is the cause? And then someone had a question about this. This is a great uh, point here too. Um, what is the cause of allergic vaccines in patients getting the COVID-19 vaccine? So in the incidence of allergic reactions for the flu shot, it is um, the versus the flu shot, rather, the COVID vaccine is about 10 times at least as likely to cause an allergic reaction. So this, from, from the perspective of this is more like one in a million versus one in 90,000 shots. So it's still not very common, but it is much more common than the flu shot. Um, an update that I was just researching here this morning, as of January 6, there's 29 anaphylactic reactions in the United States. We think that, you know, and this is a, a conjecture now because there's no proof of this, but the thought is that the polyethylene glycol additive in the, um, in the COVID-19 vaccines can potentially be um, causing an antibody. And if someone has a prior PEG antibody, which I think is hard to test for that prior to that. I don't think there's a test for that, that I know of that that might cause an anaphylactic reaction if that person already has antibodies towards PEG. So that's what the thought is right now about what's going on. So let's compare some, uh, let me just try to get to the to the uh, questions too. Let me just see here. Um, do, 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 going to the questions. Yeah, so hydrogen peroxide would be, would be nebulized, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so Franz, if you could, uh, Franz, I hope you're on here. Let me just see. Uh, Franz. Uh, yes, hey, Franz. Good. To, all right. So, Franz is my nurse that's helped me with the notes. I think you probably have met her already, uh, but Franz can actually give me um, the name of the people that are interested in, in the hydrogen peroxide, and we could set up some, some time to meet. Um, so thank you for that. Ivermectin, same thing. If you're interested in that, just mail us. You can mail CIH main inbox. Um, and I'll put that on the chat right now and then request a time to, to chat privately about it. We'll, we'll do a quick office visit, et cetera. Um, we should talk about it before, before we you know, prescribe these things, just to, just to, just to be thorough about it. Um, what is the risk of vax of developing blood clots from a vaccine if you have propensity for blood clots or a genetic blood clotting disorder? I don't think there's a increased risk of developing blood clots from from the vaccine itself. Um, I'll talk about ways to mitigate risk from getting a vaccine in a minute. Um, Okay, uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, Carly says, what about future concerns about fertility after receiving the vaccine? I don't think there's any data on that, but I'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, that's good. Are there ways to detox from the vaccines? Uh, yes, uh, I will get to that also. Yes, that, those are all really good questions. Once you get the vaccine, does it affect how your body responds to other coronaviruses or new variants of the, of the COVID-19 virus? Yes, I believe so. We know that data from uh, the flu vaccine shows that people that got the flu vaccine are less likely to have severe coronavirus. So in theory, if you have a coronavirus infection exposure yourself, or you have the vaccine, then you have part of that spike protein that is exposed to your immune system and you have antibodies towards that spike protein, or you have a T cell response to that spike protein, you should get less of a, um, Respond, you know, less of a severe reaction if you do get a um, an infection uh, or another variant. Like I said, the South African variant seems to be a little bit more virulent in terms of is that going to dimin diminish the efficacy of this vac of these vaccines? I think there's some thought that it might, but people are not sure yet. We're, we're not sure yet. Uh, but that's a great question. Thank you, Marlo. Okay, um, do, 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 for someone with Significant autoimmune issues, do you have an opinion on the risks of the vaccine versus actually giving, getting COVID? I, I, would, I would say the risks of getting COVID would be more, uh, it would be, I think, just based on people I've seen, you know, patients with post-COVID fatigue, heart issues, you know, those type of things, immune issues, I would say the risk of getting COVID would be higher than the risk of the vaccine, especially if you mitigate it in the, in the things that we're going to talk about today. 
if you have an allergy to tetracycline drug, should you still get the vaccine? Um, so if it's an actual anaphylactic reaction to a drug or food, or certainly if there's a component of the vaccine that you're allergic to, you shouldn't get the vaccine. But if it's something else that's not in the vaccine, like a drug, but you have an anaphylactic allergy to it, my usual recommendation for that, I'll, I'll go over that in one of the slides, but I would probably think about if you truly have an anaphylactic reaction in the past to a drug or, or a food or something like that, you may want to consider going to an allergist and getting the vaccine at the allergist office in a controlled setting. That's, that's what I would do if I were you for that. Um, cancer patients, I don't, I don't see a reason to, to, to not get the vaccine for cancer patients. Thanks, Nicole, for that question. Um, hydrogen peroxide or ivermectin, people are using it both for prevention and if people get sick, yes. If one had an allergic reaction to MMR, or, uh, to the MMR vaccine, which is the mumps, measles, rubella vaccine, are people more prone to getting reactions to the COVID vaccine? I think the idea is that what is the response to any sort of allergic reaction? Is there, is there some, um, what's called an interferon one response, which is uh, a more active or more strong, a stronger cytokine response. So I think in theory, yes, that you might be more prone to a reaction with another vaccine, but it's hard to prove that. You know, I think maybe for you, I would probably say, um, Karen, you need to go to an allergist to get the shot if you want to get the shot. Why do they put PEG in the vaccines? Yeah, that's a great question. I asked that too. I was like looking that up this morning. Why do they put polyethylene glycol in the vaccines? Pe PEG has not been in other vaccines, so why do they put that in? Um, my understanding is that when you tie together the messenger RNA in a lipid nanoparticle to deliver it inside the cell, so the lipids get the vaccine inside the cell, but I believe that the PEG, the polyethylene glycol, is a way to kind of keep everything together, kind of tie everything together. That's my understanding of why. I don't know why the other ones don't, but my guess is it has something to do with the specific formulation for the lipid nanoparticle with the mRNA, and that's why they need the PEG. Um, I, I have to research, uh, are there any other vaccines that don't contain PEG? I mean, certainly the AstraZeneca doesn't contain PEG, but I looked at it closely this morning and it does contain polysorbate, which is a, a uh, relative to PEG. So it's almost like the same thing. Um, nebulized hydrogen peroxide is both preventative and treatment in theory. It's alternative, it's not considered FDA approved, et cetera, but that is, that is considered a possible you know, treatment from an integrated perspective. Okay, I'm gonna have to stop here and I'll, I'm gonna go back to these questions and I'll, I'll go back to, to, um, to this question about autoimmune issues in a bit. Okay, thank you for the, all the questions, great questions. So let's compare options right now for uh, the vaccine. So I'm gonna present three that I did a little bit of a deep dive into on um, which are Moderna, uh, oops, I think I, did I, did I go back? Let me just, oh, Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca. So Pfizer is the first one that was approved by, uh, by the, not approved, but authorized by the FDA. The approved and authorized are different. So approved for emergency use by the FDA. Uh, authorized, I, I keep on I'm mixing that up, authorized by the FDA. It's called BNT162B2. It's a messenger RNA vaccine. There's two shots that are given in the upper arm, 21 days apart. Each dose is 30 micrograms of mRNA. And it also contains lip, lipid nanoparticles, polyethylene glycol, and then some electrolyte salts and sucrose. Both the salts and sucrose are used to balance the pH in the body. There's no eggs, latex, or preservatives, and the EUA is for ages 16 plus, and the first shots were given in December. There's a phase three clinical trial, uh, 40,000 people, and 94% effective in age greater than 65. It is 96% effective in ages um, under 65. There's reactogenic side effects, including um, fever, chills, joint pain, muscle pain, headache, fatigue, injection site pain. Uh, younger people may report these more based on the fact that the immune system may be stronger in younger people. Not all people are, are like that, but the immune system is kicking into gear and that's what's causing these symptoms, uh, these side effects. The side effects are found have been found to be more common after the second dose. Moderna is the second mRNA vaccine that was authorized by the FDA for emergency use. It's called mRNA 1273. 
And there's two shots 28 days apart, again, given in the upper arm. The, the first one I mentioned was 21 days apart, Pfizer, this is 28 days apart. This dose was 100 micrograms, which is over three times the dose of the, of the first one for mRNA. Um, so it contains the mRNA, the lipid particles, the polyethylene glycol again. It does have uh, some tromethamine, which is a chemical that's used to balance the pH. Acetic acid and sucrose also used to balance the pH. There are no eggs, latex, or preservatives either. And this one's approved for 18, 18 up and up, whereas Pfizer's um, approved for 16 and up. Uh, first shots were also given last month. And this is a phase three clinical trial as well. That was done with about 30,000 people. And this showed, this showed, um, this was 94.5% overall, but in age greater than 65, it showed slightly less effectiveness of 86%. It's still fairly good. Same side effects. And then AstraZeneca has not been authorized yet in the US. Um, this is considered a viral vector DNA vaccine. This is not an mRNA vaccine. So they use a chimpanzee adenovirus. That's what's called Chad Ox one So a chimpanzee adenovirus that's genetically engineered to attach the spike protein, um, uh, I guess the DNA to, to the vaccine. So basically the DNA gets inside the cell nucleus and then instructs it to produce mRNA that goes into the cytoplasm that produces spike protein. So this is a weakened adenovirus. It's not, um, it's not something that can replicate in your system though. It, it's sort of, so it is an adenovirus, but it's not something that can spread to other cells or something. And it, include, it encodes for the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein and other various excipients, including polysorbate 80, which is a relative of polyethylene glycol. So I think people with a PEG allergy, people that have allergies, they, I, I don't see how this one is more advantageous from a PEG perspective. It is a DNA vaccine and DNA vaccines have been um, you know, tested and have been given to humans for much longer than, than an mRNA vaccine, which is just happening you know, a couple months ago here. Um, but but the, I think the trials are not as robust for this. There's a 70% effectiveness they had to stop one of the trials because they gave the wrong dose to a group of people. And so there's actually these two clinical trials, one that was less than a thousand people in the UK, one that was 10,000 people in Brazil, and they combined those together to try to get approval. And they did get approval in the UK, but not in the US yet. Same side effects too, um, as for the other two vaccines. So who should, who should uh, think about using caution with this or who should basically who should talk to so I would say from a perspective of who should get the vaccine, it is an individual decision. It is something that, you know, uh, I decided to get for myself, actually, I got the Pfizer first uh, dose last Tuesday and um, for a variety of personal reasons, professional reasons, but, you know, I think getting a vaccine and doing natural health things are not mutually exclusive. And I've decided to do both of those things. Um, for me, I did experience, oops, I did experience some fever and chills and, you know, I wasn't really feeling that great for one or two days, but I took a bunch of supplements and I rested and I feel normal now. But I think it's important that to say that I don't think vaccines will become mandatory in any state or um, I don't think people generally are going to, you know, make this mandatory. Um, I also think that it's an individual decision. You should talk to your practitioners about if you have questions. There are special populations that really have to think about it. People with a history of polyethylene glycol and polysorbate should not get this vaccine because they all have those in it. So you should not get the vaccine if you have that. In general, if you have a severe allergy, like someone said they have an allergy to tetracycline or you have an anaphylaxis reaction to food or, or another vaccine, you may, want to think, uh, you may want to think about this a little bit more. And also if you get it, you would, you would want to go to your allergist and get the shot there really instead of like sort of at the clinic or something at, the, at a pharmacy. Immunocompromised populations also, this hasn't really been tested with people that are on biologics for rheumatoid arthritis or chronic and steroid infections and things like that. I, I wouldn't say people with chronic Lyme per se are technically immunocompromised based on the conventional definition. I think that, you know, you could consider still getting that, but again, you can talk to your practitioner about that. When they say immunocompromised, they're talking about people with heart failure, um, they're potentially, um, uh, actually more people with biologics, I would say, uh, not, not heart failure, that, let me just take that back. Um, people that are on medications that are actively suppressing the immune systems of steroids, 
biologics uh, would be you know, two of the obvious populations. And then the, the, uh, the vaccine was not really tested in pregnant or breastfeeding women, is not studying that population. It is worth noting that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has recommended this vaccine to pregnant women, but it is not studied in this population yet. Okay, so let me see if I can. Do you prefer Pfizer or, or Moderna? I, I don't think there's a real difference between them, honestly. If you look at it from a demographic perspective, age greater than uh, 65 and older, it was slightly more efficacious in the uh, Pfizer group. I think it was 94 versus 86%. But other than that, I don't see a huge difference between them. The, the other thing is, well, I guess the other thing is from a, you know, you have to think which one is available, you know, for in your, in your um, community, you know, because I think there's still not a complete abundance of it. I think that they're trying to turn out these vaccines. Um, I think, you know, Pfizer does have a lower dose, and I think that they both seem to be as efficacious, you know, so from that perspective, you know, that could be one consideration for you. Okay, so let me go back to the questions for a second. There's a lot of questions. Thank you for the questions. Um, if, if there's several, if someone has several autoimmune conditions, would you recommend considering getting the vaccine? I think you could still consider getting it. I don't think that would be what about heart and lung issues? Same thing. I don't think that would be precluding you. I think it's more along the lines of, you know, do you have an anaphylactic reaction? Do you have severe um, reactions immune-wise to something? Then, then you would look at, like I said, either, uh, you know, do you need that vaccine or is it something you would get at an allergist office? Okay. Um, should someone with Lyme get the vaccine? Same thing. I don't think that would preclude anyone from getting it really. Should someone traveling abroad who likely cannot get the dose in time for the second one still take the first dose? I know that the Pfizer um, data show that there's 57% efficacy for preventing disease or symptoms in, after the first dose alone. So, um, but I, ideally you would, you would wanna try to get them together, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, ideally, because that's, that's how the study was done. Have you looked at the J&J &J vaccine? Uh, I haven't looked at that one. I think that one is gonna be uh, rolled out in India, I believe. Uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if that one's actually gonna be rolled out here. So uh, let me know if you know differently. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, where can we get the vaccine safely without getting COVID at the place? Um, honestly, I would, I would go to an allergist for, for you. Uh, Wendy, yeah. Okay. Um, the vaccine that's not using PEG. The vaccine that's not using PEG, um, I mean, the AstraZeneca one, like I said, uses polysorbate 80, which is like PEG. So to me, it's not a huge difference. Um, there may be other ones that don't use PEG that, you know, we can, but if, it, you know, assuming that they are available, if they are, then certainly we'll have an update on this and we can have another. We can have another call about this um, in a month if you'd like, and we can totally kind of keep kind of doing these to, to just get the, the information out there. If you have a bad reaction to the first shot, um, vomiting for three days, migraine and fever, should you get the booster? Um, I, I would I would say I would say yes, just because you know um, if you just get one shot, you're not really getting all the efficacy anyway, and then you suffered all that time for for basically for nothing, so I, I would get it. But let's, we'll talk, um, I think I have a slide somewhere about how to mitigate uh, mitigate vaccine um, response, you know, uh, if possible, like over response. If you get your second dose later than the suggested 21 to 28 days, will that influence efficacy? Potentially, yes, because the studies were done in that 28, uh, 21 to 28 day range. So I, I don't think people know what would happen if you got it after, after that. Does the AstraZeneca vaccine change the DNA? Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, it does, uh, you know, is a DNA vaccine. So I guess it goes into the cell nucleus in that way, but um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I could do more research on it though. Is tetracycline in the shot? No, the answer is no for that. Why would someone choose the AstraZeneca vaccine if it's less effective? Um, they're going to plan to roll out 3 billion doses of that. And so it's just going to be more widely used. I think certainly it's going to be used in a lot of the uh, developing world. It's going to be used a lot here. I mean, the fact is, I think that the other 
vaccines. There's just not enough of them to go around for Pfizer and Moderna. So um, is, it, is it less effective for everyone? It's probably effective for some populations. I certainly think the data are not as compelling from a percentage wise though as the other two vaccines. Um, it is also not an mRNA vaccine and some people don't wanna have a mRNA vaccine because it hasn't been really um, given live to you know human population yet, but based on the science, I believe it's safe. You know, compared to other vaccines, in in a way, it doesn't have aluminum, mercury, some of the other things that that other vaccines have. Um, if you suspect you might have an allergic reaction, where it's the safest place to get it, it would be an allergist office, I would say. Yes, and definitely bring the EpiPen along. Yes. Okay. Um, Email question. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm wondering about some of the preservative ingredients. Uh, yeah, same thing. So same same answer, really. Um, I think there could be an issue with, with that with people that have severe allergies and toxic reactions and you could consider going to an allergist. Um, I don't think Moderna or Pfizer are, are, they're about the same to me. I don't think one is better than the other. And, and I don't think the vaccine will be mandatory. I mean, it, th that's not I don't think that's the American way anyway to make things mandatory with the, the vaccine. It's, it's more an individual choice. I think that's how it should be really. Um, when is it safe to socialize without a mask after the second dose? I think that that's a great question, Kathleen. I think you would still have to wear a mask because again, we don't know if transmission won't happen after getting the vaccine. Like a vaccine is not proven yet to prevent transmission. So you could be carrying it even with the vaccine and then give it to someone else. So basically it doesn't really change that part of it right now. I think the idea is with immunity building up, ideally what can happen is the prevalence of the cases go down so that there's just less coronavirus around and then eventually the restrictions can be lifted. That's what, that's what I think the hope is here. Um, if you're on the vaccine, if you're on interferon for 10 years to treat MS, um, I don't know, that's a good question. Um, if you were on it, but not on it now, I mean, in theory, you're not, uh, you, you know, your immune system is, is, you know, kind of back to equilibrium now. So I would just double check with your immunologist or neurologist about that. Supplements to take to decrease the minor post-vaccine symptoms. Yes. Um, yes. Let me, I'll get to that. So I'm going to try to get to, so this is what's going on right now. I'm going to get to a couple more slides and then we'll, we'll do all discussion after this. Um, the U.S. has administered over 9 million doses and basically around 2.8 doses per 100 people right now. And Maryland's about three doses per 100 people right now. That's where we are. Here's are some resources to go to in terms of where we are in terms of timeline. We're in Maryland, we're at 1A and in Virginia, we're at 1A and 1B. And then in D.C., um, they're basically also at 1A, but then they just opened up on, I think, December, uh, January 11th, rather, there's a vaccine signup now available for DC residents. If you live in the District of Columbia and you're age 65 and older, you can register to get a vaccine. Although I think there's no va vaccine available right now, but you can get on the waiting list for that. So here's all the, um, here's all the links to, and we have them on our cihealth.org website as well, in terms of links to some of the timeline for when this is gonna roll, rolled out by the Maryland governor, Larry Hogan, um, and, and Virginia and DC and, and those, and those, uh, those governments as well. Um, so here we get to the kind of the end of the slides and then we'll have some more time for questions. I'll try to go through all the questions. Let's talk real generally about how to boost vaccine efficacy. So you decide you're going to get a vaccine. How do you boost vaccine efficacy? There's two things you have to think about that are, that are evidence-based. One is sleep. You try to get at least six hours of sleep because that's going to boost antibody production based on other studies versus, um, uh, against, um, uh, rather dealing with flu uh, vaccines and hepatitis A vaccines. This has been shown in multiple studies to boost vaccine efficacy in terms of antibody production if you get at least six hours of sleep. Um, and in terms of, yeah, for, for Wendy or anyone else that lives um, in the districts, yeah, I, I think that this is not available under 65 yet. I, I don't think it's available yet for, uh, for everyone. Um, I think it's only 65 and up in the, in the district there. Strengthening and balancing the immune system. So how do we increase T regulatory cells? These are things like probiotics, vitamin D, getting out of sleep again, meditation. Um, uh, let's see, uh, there's a lot of other things, but short chain fatty acids are basically bouncing the gut microbiome again. 
um, how do you reduce cytokine storm following effects from the vaccination? I took, uh, I took melatonin, glutathione, I took some vitamin C, I took a bunch of vitamin D uh, because vitamin D does reduce the cytokine storm via inhibition of what's called interleukin-6. Um, zinc is important to help with just overall immune system as well. So a lot of these things uh, are fairly uh, available over the, over the counter, et cetera. If you want, I can put together a uh, sort of a supplement list I would recommend or some things we would recommend and, and, and sort of kind of put it out there in the public if, if you're interested in that. If you are, just let me know and, and um, just type in the chat box or something. Um, how, to, how to reduce the cytokine storm following either infection or vaccination. We can, we can put that in there. Great, um, thank you. Um, integrative consideration. So I think one thing that is not really well uh, discussed is, you know, is the vaccine going to kick off autoimmunity? Is it going to actually inflame the immune system more? That's why the sleep, the gut microbiome, increasing the T regulatory cells, et cetera, are really, really important whether or not you decide to get the vaccine or not. So it's going to help with vaccine efficacy. It's going to reduce the vaccine side effects. And it's going to also help you prevent getting COVID in general, all these different integrative approaches that are going to basically balance and strengthen the immune system, which we've talked about in previous webinars and group visits and things like that. So I'm going to stop the share, and then we're going to go to some discussion here. Great. So now I can see all the questions. Um, thank you for attending. We have a few more minutes here. Um, let's see, where am I on this? Uh, where can the immune, yeah, okay. There is no mercury in the vaccines. Yeah, that's a good thing. Are there any pharmacies you know of giving vaccines? Um, I don't think we know that there's pharmacies that really have them available yet. I think we're still in phase 1A in Maryland, which is for healthcare for some of these more, um, you know, workers that, that are kind of in, in the public eye there. Uh, I think that uh, that website that I shared on the slides, if you go to Maryland coronavirus timeline, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see that and see where we are in terms of the phases. And that's kind of up to the governor and the state there. Um, yes, having a bee allergy may be, um, you know, it, it could be have, you know, increased risk for an anaphylactic reaction. So again, I would make sure. Um, if you have had the virus, should you still get one of the vaccines? They do recommend that you could still get the vaccine because they don't know how long natural immunity lasts. So the answer to that is yes. If you have side effects from the vaccine, is it okay to take Tylenol or Advil for fever and aches, or does that decrease the ability of the body to mount the best immune response? Yeah, um, that's a tough one. I mean, you're going to increase your ability to feel good. <laughs> Um, thank, thanks, Mia. Um, I think, you know, you will have less body aches and fever, but in theory that that might, in theory, that might decrease the body's ability to mount the, uh, the best immune response. So I, I would go more towards vitamin C, melatonin, vitamin D, some of the other things. See, severe seasonal allergies, I, I wouldn't say, you know, it's, it's, these things, Carly, are not really researched so much in terms of where do you draw the line between like anaphylactic versus severe seasonal allergies, but I, I wouldn't say severe seasonal allergy would be um, would be necessarily an increased risk factor versus anaphylaxis. I think what you have to look at is the mast cell issue with uh, severe seasonal allergies. So ideally find a time that you're not flaring, you know, find a time, take some vitamin C, take some quercetin, take some luteal and, you know, whatever you want to do to reduce allergies and then get a vaccine then instead of when you're in a flare. I probably wouldn't take a vaccine when you're in an allergic flare, if that makes sense. Um, hydroxychloroquine is still controversial. I think um, ivermectin, which is another medication, like I shared on that IMAS protocol with the FLCCC, that website, that, that has much more evidence for it. There's multiple clinical trials. I think there's about 10 clinical trials now on ivermectin. So I'm much more comfortable using that, given that hydroxychloroquine can cause kidney issues and eye issues and the heart issues and a bunch of other things. I think there were some studies in the beginning that were positive and then it became more mixed. So I would definitely favor ivermectin over HCQ at this point in terms of medication. Um, Franz, can you, uh, yeah, let me know about the supplement. Let's just write me an email about that and we'll do that. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see, do, 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 do. Uh, questions. If you already had COVID, why would you need the vaccine? Yes. 
That's a great question. Um, I think that in theory, if you have the antibodies and you want to get tested and stuff that, you know, do you really need the vaccine or not? I think officially they're saying, yes, you still should get the vaccine. Um, I think, you know, and from a perspective of a functional kind of medicine perspective, do you really need the vaccine? I think that's sort of debatable. I mean, if you have antibodies, B cell antibodies, and in theory, you had a reaction. You know, if you had COVID and you had a reaction, uh, if you had COVID and you had a fairly severe reaction, then it's likely that your B cells produced antibodies and your T cells mounted a response. So in theory, you would likely have a T cell um, memory response kind of ready to go to lock and load on that if you happen to get exposed to that again. So I think that is debatable whether or not you need the vaccine or not, if you already had COVID or not. Um, it, do, they, do the antibodies go away? Um, yes, I, so I, I think the natural defense is there. Again, I think you have to really consider that very closely. How can you test for a T cell status? I don't think this is really uh, widely available. I mean, I think this is available in the research setting really more, uh, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the T cell status. Can a DC resident with a Maryland practitioner get the vaccine in Maryland? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't the answer to that. I am not sure about that. Um, I think that there's probably some talk about crossing state lines and we should try to do that for you know public health purposes, but I don't I I don't know. I think we'll research that to see down the line. I'm sure the governor are talking to each other about that. Um, there will be a replay on Facebook and YouTube, and Jen is going to put this up on all of our sites. So yes, there, we, there will be a replay. Thank you for attending. Um, so we will be, what we'll be doing here in our clinic is we'll be, if people want the vaccine, certainly we'll have an individualized discussion with each person about it. We will then refer them to a pharmacy or uh, or a, a place that we're going to be giving them, uh, you know, like a hospital, et cetera. Et cetera. We're not going to be carrying them here for logistical reasons. Um, basically, um, the slides, we won't have the slides available to email. I don't think unless Jen, correct me if I'm wrong about that. I know the slides would be available online. We'll just be having the recording online. Yeah, um, the fertility, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. So the fertility concern. So the, my understanding of the mRNA is that it doesn't get into the cell nucleus, so it shouldn't affect fertility, it should not. Um, do vaccines in general for, affect fertility? I, I don't think the answer to that is known from a DNA vaccine perspective, but, but I think these long-term effects, like you know, anything more than four months, right? Because these vaccines haven't been around for more than four months in terms of being studied in phase three or post-marketing, which is considered phase four. So I think long-term questions like that are gonna just have to be answered as they come about. You know, most, like I said, most vaccine studies are years and they're not a couple months. So that is a, that is a consideration here. Um, like I said, the ACOG, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology has recommended that it's okay, it's considered safe, you know, in theory, um, but I think it's not really known about long-term side effects of that. Yeah, that's, I think, the, the most accurate answer. Um, I've had a reaction to the CT contrast dye, which was not anaphylactic shock. I don't think that would be a reason to, to you know, one way or the other to get a vaccine or not. Melatonin, I, I like um, Quicksilver is a good brand. Uh, that, that is a good brand because it's a liposomal melatonin that you can get professionally. Um, and then that is a good one. I would say another one would be Source Naturals is a good one you can buy over the counter. Yes. Um, why is ivermectin not suggested more widely as a treatment and prevention? I don't know. I was wondering that my, myself. If you have an answer, let me let me know. I mean, I, I'm sure that, um, you know, because this is considered some, you know, I, I will say anecdotally, we anecdotally, um, we we know we have we have people here at CIH that or from other countries that their ivermectin is widely available. In fact, in some countries, I think in Africa, if I believe that's correct, this is considered uh, an over-the-counter, I believe. Is that, let me make sure uh, I'm saying that right. Uh, let me see if, uh, yeah, anyway, um, basically a lot of these places that's over-the-counter. And so, you know, is there less uh, incidence of and, and prevalence of, of coronavirus because it's available, you know, widely over the counter. It's hard to say, but um, 
you know, I, I certainly think that this could be used more uh, ivermectin, you know, based on the trial data that's in, in Peru. Yeah, thank you, in Peru, Christine, and that is available in Peru. And I think, I think maybe in Africa too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, would you recommend aspirin or, or NSAIDs or Tylenol if one con contacts, of that, the contacts the virus? I mean, if you have a high fever, go ahead and take Tylenol. You, know, you don't want it to be super high. You know, if you're one in 1.5 and you're uncomfortable, then go ahead and take that. Now, from my perspective, what I would also do though is think about adding melatonin, think about adding vit high dose vitamin D, vitamin C for sure, um, zinc, you know, which also can potentially reduce viral replication. Um, some herbs can be really helpful. There's a lot of things that you could do to, to potentially mitigate the um, inflammatory cytokine response from coronavirus. So aspirin, um, aspirin I think is part of the IMS protocol if someone actually gets the virus because it is an anticoagulant and it reduces blood clotting. So there is a idea that COVID also can cause lung clots and heart attacks and strokes and you know basically blood clots. So aspirin would be reasonable, and this is something that the integrative doctors recommend from that FLCCC protocol, IMAS protocol, in terms of if someone gets COVID, take 325 milligrams of aspirin a day, you know, while you're feeling symptomatic. So that would be something. If you didn't want to take an aspirin because you have a history of ulcers or whatnot, you can take cur curcumin, which also has a blood thinning effect as well. Um, Omega-3s, whether algae oil or fish oil, or krill oil, things like that would also be help put it down regularly with the, what's called the inflammasome response. So that's another thing that I would take as well, which I'll have all that, you know, we'll, we'll type all that out and, and send that to everyone here. Um, let's see, does the vaccine last longer in your system than your own defense? That is not a known, uh, we don't know that really. Will everyone need vaccines again in six months? I hope not. <laughs> I hope we don't need a booster. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm hoping we don't need a booster because if we have a T-cell response, the T-cell re response might last years or decades, and then I don't think we're going to need a booster. At least that's my thought about it. Um, okay. Will most allergists be administering vaccine? I'm not sure. I think likely, but um, why don't you maybe call your allergist and, and let me know. Um, Nancy, we'll, what we'll do, uh, I mean, friends, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll put together a more curated list with brands and things like that, and we'll, we can send it out to, to people here. Um, maybe, uh, Jen, I can have the attendee list, et cetera, like that. Um, uh, what has been taking, what is this, been, been taking celebration? Can you, uh, Ellen, can you clarify that for a second? Glutathione. So um, glutathione, I think, can really help in reducing inflammation um, after the vaccine, yes. Um, I think it could be preventative, although you can't um, technically say that as a supplement. You can't say that it's used for prevention for COVID. But I think from the perspective of, you know, is it going to reduce that inflammatory response, it should do that. So I, I, would, I would use it as a way to boost your immune system, yes. Celebrex, OK. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're taking it for many years, there's no reason to stop Celebrex. Yeah, I, I wouldn't stop it just, just for that. Okay, so we're about an hour here. You can watch the recording on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope everyone stays healthy, and we are going to get through this together. Thank you so much, everyone.